Okay, so what I'm talking to you guys about is business cycles. Uh, again, this is going to be a very sort of cursory overview. I'll, I'll give you, let me show you. Oh, there we go. You may want to uh, jot these four, a, the A, B, and C, Ds down because you'll, you'll see in a minute when I go through this particular part, I'm going to have like a graphical exposition of the, of the different things without the labels popping up. So, but I am going to respect this um, ordering. So if you just want to have those jotted down so later on when I'm talking about it, you'll, you'll know what I'm saying in case, because you might not see it in terms of the text. So this is the outline of what I'm going to do for the next 50 minutes. Let me just make a point here. So as, as far as these different schools of thought, generalizing a lot of the uh, people at this conference are not going to be subscribed to the Keynesian view, but I'm going to just explain that so you know what it is. But then among these other three, uh, there are lots of free market economists who might be politically libertarian, might be fans of the Independent Institute, may even have written books for the Independent Institute that would be in one of these, you know, one of these versus the other. Okay, so like I'm, just to, to let you know, I'm going to focus later on the talk on the Austrian explanation of the business cycle. So that's what part three is going to be. And then at part four, I will show you if the Austrian view is correct why what governments typically do in response to a downturn in the economy is the exact wrong thing. Okay, so the problem when we, when we say is like as economists, what's, what's the business cycle, what's causing it, or you know, what are we trying to explain? The, the issue is market economies do not just increase step by step over time. They have these upswings and then these crashes. And so there's this uneven growth, so certainly you know, our real output now is higher than it was in the year 1800, but it was not just a steady improvement over time. Like I said, there was these periods of, of apparent prosperity and crashes. So this chart is real gross domestic product. And I don't know if you can see, this is 1930, 1950, 70, and, and so on. So you can just see, the, the, this is in terms of levels, how you know, in the 30s it actually went down for the first few years, right? So it was output was, was lower like by, by 1933 than it had been in 1929. And then it comes up, crashes again. And then you can see like here in the early 80s, there was a bad uh, recession. And by the way, these shadings are when the um, National Bureau of Economic Research officially classifies it as a recession. And there was the dot com crash and you can see how bad uh, the recent, what they call the Great Recession was, okay, that in many uh, respects, the, what they call the Great Recession from late 2007 to 2009 was the worst thing to hit the global economy since the 1930s, and by some measures, it was arguably worse, okay, like if you look at like industrial production um, relative to the, to the pre-recession peak, it actually, by this point, is, was higher in Europe than it is in some European countries right now. All right, so in other words, so it wasn't that the depths of the Great Recession were worse than the depths of the Great Depression in the 30s, but the point is if you say by some metrics of industrial output for some places in Europe, by this point after the crash, they were doing better in the 30s than they are right now. So the, the idea is like the recovery has been much more sluggish in some regions than it was even in the 30s. Okay, so the point is, you know, this, this is history, this is what we are faced with, so the task for economists then is to explain this, and, and then presumably also to advise policymakers is to say, okay, why does this keep happening? Is there anything we can do? So you can imagine this is a very complex problem in econ just to let you in on the secret, let the cat out of the bag, the economists do not all agree on what causes this, and that's one of the huge areas of dispute among them. Okay, so I'm going to now walk you through those schools of thought. So this ties into the, you know, those A, B, C, D that I talked to you before about. Uh, and, and I'll do it in the sense of showing you different book covers. Okay, so the, the standard Keynesian position was laid out by John Maynard Keynes. So his book, The General Theory, and notice the full title is The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. But people short, shorthand referred to it as The General Theory. That came out in 1936. And uh, th this is what laid out what we now think of as Keynesian economics. 
And so I'm going to, with, these, with this particular slide, I'm going to have to be really quick here to just do a, a broad view of each of these different schools of thought. But the, the Keynesian view would say what happens in modern market economies when there's a big downturn is that there's a collapse in aggregate demand. Okay, pe biz, people in the private sector are not spending enough either on consumption or investment, and there's various reasons for why that might be. But the point is there's not enough total spending to employ everybody. And so part of the, what Keynes was doing in, the, in his, this book was to explain why were the classical mechanisms, right? So the, the, the things that classical economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo and the people coming after them, notably uh, Jean-Baptiste say, you know, they, they would have explained why if there is a, a drop in spending, the market should fix itself. Well, Keynes has to give an explanation in this book as to why that normal mechanism is, is pie in the sky and being too optimistic and actually a market economies can get stuck for years in an equilibrium where there's large unemployment. All right? and, so the, and so the timing of this was great coming out in 1936, that's in the midst of this awful, you know, the, the worst economic downturn the world had ever seen and it certainly looked like to people at the time that hey, capitalism isn't working, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't things have fixed themselves by now, it's not. Another element of this, just so you, you know rhetorically why this was so effective, so the title there, The General Theory. So there he was um, making a comparison or an analogy or an allusion, I guess you would say, to Einstein's general theory of relativity. Okay, so it, this was really brilliant. What Keynes was doing here, he wasn't so much saying the classical economists were crazy and they were totally wrong and here's the better theory. Instead, what he was saying is the classical theory, you know, what, what those free market economists are teaching in the other universities and what policymakers have thought was doctrine or dogma up until the late 1920s when it blew up in their faces, he was saying that was correct in the special case of full employment. Okay, and so Keynes was saying, yeah, it is true that if, uh, you know, people stop spending money on saloons and start spending money over here on Bibles, that there's no reason to expect the whole economy to crash, just resources would get reallocated, and he's saying, but that assumes there's full employment. But he's saying, I'm studying the more general theory, which can handle cases where employment drops and we don't have enough aggregate demand to employ everybody. So again, just to make sure you're getting it, he was, he was not just saying the classical writers, everybody who's come before me was totally wrong. He was saying they're studying this narrow special case of full employment. I'm giving you a theory that can explain everything. Okay, so it was rhetorically, so that's kind of like what, if you don't know this, what Einstein's theories did vis-a-vis -vis Newtonian mechanics, right? So Einstein was not saying that, yeah, Isaac Newton's laws of motion or whatever are totally wrong. He was saying, oh yeah, the Newtonian system is largely correct if you're not dealing with something that's really massive and the speeds are not close to the speed of light. But if you violate those assumptions, then Newton's you know, system gives you totally erroneous predictions. Whereas my theory is, is more robust, is, the, is a more general case. All right, so that was what Keynes was, was doing there, and that's partly why it was so effective. Okay, uh, modern times, a good example of this would be Paul Krugman. You know, so he writes for the New York Times, Nobel Prize winner. Um, so his book, End This Depression Now, was a very Keynesian analysis. Okay, so now I'm moving on to the monetarist explanation of depression or of recessions. So here, um, I, I have to be careful here. So this is Milton Friedman, if you can't read that in the back. So the, his famous work with Anna Schwartz, um, they had what was called a monetary history of uh, of the economy and they then pulled out their treatment of the of the great contraction and then it was published as a separate uh, book so here I mean again Milton Friedman from the Chicago School a very free market guy but I just want to in this slide I'm just going to show you how they have different approaches to explain what happened in the Great Depression so for Friedman the issue was in the 1920s Typically what would happen is when things got, um, when the economy slowed down, the Federal Reserve would come in, loosen monetary policy, and then you know, stimulate things and the economy would get over that hump and then normal capitalism, market forces, price system, all the stuff that Yvonne talked about in the last lecture, you know, did their magic and that was great. And the, the, the Fed just kept the economy going on course. 
but for various reasons, Friedman and Schwartz argued, uh, the Fed in the late 1920s tightened when they, did, when they shouldn't have, and that's what caused the stock market crash. And then when you say, okay, but why did the 29 stock market crash lead to what we now call the Great Depression? They were saying, well, there was a lot of stupid things that Herbert Hoover did, but the really critical thing that broke the back of the economy was the quantity of money shrank by about a third from 1929 to 1933. Okay, so let me just say that again, make sure you, in case you don't know that. So a certain measurement of how many dollars are in existence in the economy, that was cut by about one third from 1929 to 1933. And so Friedman and Schwartz are, were saying the Fed was basically asleep at the wheel. That given that the Federal Reserve, you know, was installed and was ultimately in charge of the nation's money supply, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, he's saying the Fed was clearly in charge running the show during this period, and so they were asleep at the wheel. Um, specifically what was happening, and it's not that the Fed officials woke up one day and said, you know what, there's too much money, let's cut it by a third. That's not what happened. Rather, there were you know, bank failures and um, people were panicked, and so they were running to their local banks taking out money, and then that was causing the banks to go under. All right, so you, like you saw It's a Wonderful Life, you know, that famous scene in the beginning when people are rushing to the bank. So that happens because of what's called the fractional reserve system. And so the, just the way modern banking works, as I'm sure you guys know, if everybody tries to go and take his or her money out at once, the bank can't meet everyone's requests because it's not like they have all the money sitting in the back vault with your name on it. And so that's what was happening in the early 30s. And if you think about it, Okay, so it's like this. If you put $1,000 into a bank and then they end up lending out 900 of it to other people, you still think you have $1,000 in the bank, but now there's 900 other dollars that other people think they have. So it's like that $1,000 just turned into 1,900. You guys getting that? Okay. And so th the opposite can happen though too. So right now if there's $1,900 just from those operations. What if I panic and go and I take my $1,000 out and the bank fails, those other 900 people now don't have it, so it's like $900 just disappeared. Okay, just like in the same way that the bank, by lending my money out, can kind of create money. If, if people panic and start pulling their cash out of the banks, the opposite happens and it destroys money. So that's the sense, it's that kind of measurement when I say the money supply shrunk by a third, that's what I mean. It's not that the Fed went out and deliberately destroyed green pieces of paper, it's that when you add up all the checking account balances, that number shrunk by a third from 29 to 33. And so Friedman and Schwartz were saying the Fed should have counteracted that by pumping a lot more money in, you know, from the top to counteract the fact that it was shrinking because all the people were pulling their cash out of the banks. So when you're then wondering, you know, why did prices fall so significantly from 29 to 33? Why was just apparently crippling deflation? They would say, well, because the Fed sat back while the money supply got cut by a third. What do you think is going to happen? Okay, so that is very loosely the, the standard monetarist explanation of the Great Depression. So this, a modern version of that is uh, Scott Sumner's book, The Midas Paradox, you'll see from the Independent Institute. Okay, so, um, you know, he's an affiliated scholar, so this is, you know, very uh, well received among free market circles. And his explanation, he, in this book, he explains, you know, that, that view of the Great Depression but then Sumner argues that's actually what's going on with the Great Recession, that he thinks uh, central banks around the world through various policy missteps actually caused everybody to really rush to hold money and money was by certain measurements too tight uh, in, the, in the fall of 2008 and that's why the crisis occurred and then that um, policymakers since then have, have handled monetary policy poorly and that's the explanation for why the global economy has been stuck in this rut for so long. Okay, this book, uh, Cooley, I was just trying to find a representative of this is what's called um, real business cycle theory. So this one I don't know as well as the others, but I just wanted to mention it since I'm tasked with giving you guys an overview of business cycles. So here, again, these are very free market people who are typically associated with this view, and in their approach, they're saying that, um, so just the very title of it, of, of the, school, the school of thought or the theory, it's, again, 
real business cycle theory. So what they mean by real there is not monetary. Okay, so they're saying when we're trying to explain, you know, that pattern I showed you in the beginning of why the economies grow and then crash, grow and crash, a lot of economists, all the ones I've mentioned so far, are focusing on money or, or spending perhaps. You know, the Keynesians are saying, yeah, it's, no, there's not enough spending. The um, monetarists, including Scott Sumner, who calls himself a market monetarist, they're saying, yeah, it's because of the central bank's policies and how they're handling money. And so there's the sense that it, it's not like there's something real going on. It's just, you know, money flows that are causing it. Whereas the, the real business cycle people, they're saying, no, it actually is a, it's a fundamental thing about technology or resources or whatever. And that actually the response we see is, is a rational equilibrium response to whatever the change was. All right, so there, there could be like a, if there's a shock to resources, like pe workers aren't as productive as they were before for some reason, or there's a crop failure or something like that, you can build little mod mathematical models and have the outcome be that given things uh, also, it's hard for, like, for workers and businesses to match up with each other, there's search costs. And so you could have a bunch of skills as a worker, employers could have a need for someone with certain skills, but you might have a hard time finding each other, right? And so um, when you factor in all those things, you can come up with models where the equilibrium outcome that's optimal in the light, in light of a shock that disrupts the original system is there's a prolonged period where workers just, it's, it makes more sense for them to not take a job and just sit and, and keep searching for a better job offer, all right? And so you could have a, a period where there's um, a, a long period where people are not employed, all right? Uh, if you want a silly example just to wake you guys up, it's like the dating market. Once you break up with somebody, you don't start dating somebody tomorrow. You know, you search for a little bit, right? And hopefully there's not an exchange of money. So, okay. <laughs> Trying to wake you guys up here. All right. So, that's what real business cycle theory is. Um, to the, the way the Keynes, just to help you remember, the way the Keynesians make fun of that is, so again, the, the real business cycle explanation, if, if you apply it like in a minor recession that lasts for a year or two, it kind of makes sense. It's, it's less plausible, it just seems kind of contrived to like explain the 1930s with this sort of approach. So Keynesians make fun of it instead of calling it the Great Depression, they say, oh, real business cycle theorists call it the Great Vacation, which is how, so that's it's a kind of a, a, a slur or whatever, a straw man, but the point is they're saying, the, the Keynesians critiquing real business cycle theory are saying, you're telling me that workers are optimally deciding to engage in more leisure because when search costs get high, and it's just you can't find a great match for a potential employer, and it just makes sense for you to sit home watching Oprah instead of taking a job, give me a break, and especially for something like the Great Depression, they think it's self-evident that that's not like a normal, optimal response to the real constraints, that there's something broken with the economy or the, the, the transmission mechanism. Okay, and then lastly, and so I'll introduce it here, and then the rest of these slides I'll, I'll focus more on this because it's, it's what I personally know more about, is the Austrian explanation uh, developed by... Ludwig von Mises and elaborated on by Friedrich Hayek. So uh, I'll, I guess I'll talk to you more in a few slides about this. In terms, so this is the classic stuff, a more modern, I just signed it. All right, it's this book right here. It's this phenomenal book. Okay, and so what I did in this, and so again, another independent institute book. So you can see, you know, the, the market monetarist explanation and then, you know, the Austrian one. So that, that's why I'm saying, the, I'm making sure you're aware of the fact that there's differences even among self-described free market economists on what causes the business cycle. But in any event, what I do in this book uh, is try to take the insights of Mises and explain it. And one of my goals was to, so for the reader, by the time you're done with this book choice, to understand Austrian business cycle theory. Okay, so let me now dive in now in more detail to, and tell you about Austrian business cycle theory. Okay, so it was developed by Ludwig von Mises, who was during his heyday, the, the acknowledged dean of the so-called Austrian school. In case you haven't heard that term, I, mean, I think you guys probably figured it out by now, but the reason it's called the Austrian school, it's not because, it, it's because historically people were all from the country of Austria, all right? I'm, I'm sure that's not a shocker. Just like the Chicago school, I guess you can probably figure out why it's called that and so on, the Keynesians is obvious. Uh, 
And so the main work that he developed this theory in is, was in 1912. And then his, I don't want to say student because they, it, Hayek, you know, was already a professor and, and writing on his own before he started uh, going to the seminar that Mises put on, but his disciple, if you will, Friedrich Hayek, um, he, de he developed this uh, a primary work was Prices and Production in 31. Hayek has this statement, before we can even ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. And so he's, what he's saying is there's this um, temptation when we start studying the business cycle to just jump right into it and say, uh-oh, employment's down, there's not enough spending, so the government's got to stimulate spending. We gotta, you know, what, what can we do to, to boost employment? Uh, let's get some shovel-ready projects, right? That's the kind of talk that we've heard uh, since the 2008 crisis. It seems obvious, doesn't it, that we, you know, let, let me back up a second. What, what, what is it about a recession that's so weird? Why does it seem like something's broken? Because it's, it's kind of crazy, right, that you've got all these workers over here who have perfectly good skills, they're eager to work, and you've got factories that are idle or operating well below capacity. You've got owners of other kinds of raw materials, their sales have dropped off. You know, they, they'd be perfectly willing to sell it at, at given prices to sell more. And it's not like it's because everybody all of a sudden just says, you know what, I don't need more stuff. I've got enough cars and clothes and food and whatever for the rest of my life. I don't need, that's not what it is. People are still wanting more things in their, in their capacity as consumers. So it's like for some reason, this no, economic system that normally works so well has, has failed us, right? You've got all these different groups who if they could just coordinate their activities and get things back to normal, would all be happier and yet something's broken. So Hayek's point is, rather than just diving right into it and trying to diagnose when th you know, what's, why is it broken, he's saying first, let's explain how does this system work when it, when it is working and things are going smoothly, let's study that more carefully. And, that, and in particular, over time, like how does an economy get wealthier over time? That's why I'm, the title is a Saving Support Economic Growth. When we understand that, like how do people save and invest? How do market prices help channel investments around and resources and things grow over time so that we're wealthier now than we were in the year 1800? when you understand that baseline, then maybe it'll shed light on what could possibly screw things up when we're wondering why in a given year does output suddenly fall off a cliff. Okay, so that's what he's uh, get, getting at. Okay, so uh, Roger Garrison, who's an Austrian economist, uh, has, let me write his name down, I don't, I don't have it on the slide, but I didn't wanna just steal his PowerPoints and, and present them to you here, but if you like really cool PowerPoint shows, he's got a great um, series so if you Google his name, just do like Google Roger Garrison PowerPoint or something, you'll, you'll see it. He was at Auburn University and he's got a whole thing on his website of, of various PowerPoints and they're really, I mean, they're all cool, but a really good one for what I'm talking about here is sustainable versus unsustainable growth. And uh, so I'm gonna just verbally walk you through that. Okay, so in the Austrian view, it's genuine savings fuels sustainable growth. And that one of the primary mechanisms is interest rates that are market prices that coordinate consumers and firms over time. Just piggybacking on what the story of Ivan was talking about in the last lecture about how, you know, if you're going to use markets to allocate resources, there's prices, the profit and loss signal, you know, consumers voting with their spending behavior, and that kind of channels things one way or the other. When you think about it over time, it's more complicated, right? So, yeah, consumers, if people like their iPhones, they spend a lot on the iPhone. That's how business people know, yep, it's good for us to make iPhones, to channel resources into iPhones. They don't like the new Coke. So you know, they weren't buying it, and so Coke knew to stop doing that. All right. Um, by the way, just as an aside on that, do, do you know why Coke screwed up so much, what they did wrong? It was they had done taste tests, and they were making it sweeter because the idea was if you just take like one sip or two sips, the new Coke was better, okay? So it wasn't that they were just completely stupid. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, because when you hear a story like that, like how could they have failed so miserably? They were doing blind taste tests and all that kind of market research, and the idea was just taking a few sips, the new Coke people liked a lot more. So they thought, oh, we got a winner. 
The problem was, though, that if you had a whole can of it after a while, it was too sweet. And you're like, oh, this is disgusting. All right. And so that, that, that's what happened. Um, so anyway, back to the PowerPoint. So um, that's the sense in which, you know, in a static setting, what Yvonne talked about last lecture, people spending, consumers spending, that helps businesses allocate resources and decide, you know, are we going to make more iPhones? Are we going to make more television sets? But when you think about over time, how does that happen? And interest rates are really important. So if people, um, okay, let, let's just say there's a, a family and they have a, a kid. They have, you know, they have a new baby. And so the family sits down and they're looking at their budget and they say, okay, we got to change our spending decisions. We got a new kid here. Eventually she's going to go off to college. So we need to start saving now to prepare for that. And so the individual household, what do they do? They start saving more, so they go out to eat less, and they uh, you know, don't go to the movies as much, and so on, and they're contributing more maybe to their checking account, or maybe they're putting more into a, into a bond fund or into stocks or something in the, in the stock market. And so there's got to be some sense in which you know, households making decisions like that, or somebody saying, hey, let's save up now to go on that cruise four years from now that we want, you know, we want to take a cruise, and we want to go visit Europe or whatever, we're going to save now to do that. You can see these are pretty long-term, complicated decisions. And so one way of understanding how does this work is that when people save more, it pushes down interest rates, and that's like a green light to businesses that they can invest in longer-term projects, that consumers are willing to wait longer before they get rewarded with consumption goods. So it's not just a matter of do I want to buy vanilla ice cream versus yogurt, which you know, steers businesses right now to know, do we crank out more yogurt or more ice cream? But it's also saying like businesses right now, should they crank out more cars and television sets or should they make things like hammers and drill presses that make our labor more productive but don't actually give us goodies right away? All right, so, maybe, so maybe that's one way of thinking about it, that the economy right now can either be geared towards making consumption goods or it can make capital goods or what you might call investment goods and that's part of the, the trade-off. And so there's got to be a way of matching. If, if people save more, it means they're willing to defer consumption because they think they're going to get more down the road. Right? If, you, if you don't spend a dollar today, maybe you can spend a dollar ten in two years. And so physically, what happens is when people save more, that releases resources so the economy can kind of rebalance and make things like tractor trailers and more bridges and stuff like that and factories instead of making more uh, you know, DVDs and things like that, all right? So that's, and the interest rate is a key price that helps guide those decisions. Okay, so if that's what happens with sustainable growth, if, if, if what business people are doing genuinely matches up with consumer preferences and spending behavior, but now what happens if the reason interest rates are going down is not because people in the private sector are saving more, but what if it's just because the commercial banks decide to just flood the markets with more money? And they can do that in a fractional reserve banking system. Okay, that can happen. And so the problem there is that cheap bank credit and low interest rates lead to an unsustainable boom, which must crash. Okay, so let me just say the whole thing again real fast. The idea is with sustainable growth, with these first two bullet points, if people actually save more, then the economy can grow richer over time because it can stop making things of, you know, movie theaters and sports cars, and it can shift to stuff like drill presses, hammers, uh, more factories, right? So it can make things that are productive equipment that will make us richer down the road, but don't provide immediate gratification. However, interest rates can drop for other reasons besides an influx of genuine savings. And so if the commercial banks pump in more money through the loan market that isn't being driven by genuine savings, you get this, this imbalance. And so what happens is entrepreneurs start expanding operations. They start you know, building a factory. They start cranking out more hammers, drill presses, things like that. But people, consumers aren't actually saving more. And so there's this mismatch and it can persist for a few years. And so it gives this appearance of a boom, this artificial prosperity, 
where all the businesses are doing well. You've got the businesses that are making drill presses and hammers or hiring people, but the movie theaters and the restaurants are booming also because consumers aren't saving more. In fact, they're saving less because interest rates are lower. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff that is, is unsustainable, that things don't mesh. It can persist for a few years, but it's, it's artificial. Okay, let me um, just throw this slide in just to show you that there, there is a reason that I personally am very confident that the Austrian theory is relevant and, and it explains a lot in the real world. So when I give this, this kind of talk to a, a bigger crowd, like I, there's lots of other pieces of evidence I could show you. For you guys, let me just give you one example. Okay, so this was an Austrian economist saying, higher interest rates should trigger a reversal in the housing market and expose the fallacies of the new paradigm. This exposure will hurt homeowners and the larger problem could hit the American taxpayer who could be forced to bail out the banks and government sponsored mortgage guarantors. So that was Austrian economist Mark Thornton and he said that in June of 2004. Okay, so I mean that was, I mean it's, it's almost eerie when you see how well he exposed what, you know, what, was gonna, what was happening and what the consequences were gonna be. And of course he was relying on Austrian business cycle theory. If you guys haven't seen it, let me also just, uh, your question sparked something. Let me just give you two, two YouTube things. So go to, one is Peter Schiff was right. So here I'm not endorsing everything that Peter Schiff has said, but in terms of YouTube clips, these are hilarious. And then an even funnier one is Ben Bernanke was wrong. Okay, and for both of them, you know, make sure you get a, a, something that's got more than 30,000 views or something because there's different versions floating around, so you want to get a good one. But what, so Peter Schiff is an investment guy who happens to be a fan of the Austrian school, but he was in like 2006. What, what that clip is, if you, if you go look that one up, it's a compilation of his appearances on like CNBC and Fox Business and stuff like that, where he was in 06 and 07 warning people, yeah, there's a housing bubble in, you know, and, and, and some of the stuff he said was so accurate, it, it, like it's eerie when you hear him say it. And it wasn't that the people on the other side were like, well, Peter, I respect your opinion, but actually I differ. No, they were literally laughing in his face. You know, just like, you crazy. And, and so that's why it's kind of funny. And the Ben Bernanke was wrong it wasn't just that he made one particular statement that was off. It, it goes back to 2006 from before he was even Fed chair and just every step of the way was totally wrong. So back in 06, he's saying, yeah, people are warning about a housing bubble. We see some froth, but you know, it's not a really big deal. And then later on he was like, oh yeah, it's, uh, there's definitely a housing correction in place, but we think the damage is gonna be confined to the subprime sector. And then later, yep, yeah, there's definitely a recession, but it's not gonna to be too bad. And you know, so every step of the way, he kept just downplaying how bad things were and, and misdiagnosing it. So that's good just to give you humility and to, and to see not to trust your government officials. Okay, um, so back to this. So again, for Austrians, prices act as signals. For some people, this helps just to see it graphically. So it's a kind of silly little example, but so there's this family silhouetted to protect their identity. And um, so they're spending a lot of money going out to eat. And then, and the interest rate's 10%, and just they're saving a little bit that goes into the bank, and then the bank lends money to the factory. Okay, that's, that's the schematic here. And so then, all of a sudden, the, the, the narration's up in the front right. The family decides to save more. So what happens? The dollar bill disappears there, and it comes down here. Okay, so they're saying the family's spending less on the restaurant, and they're saving more. And how do they save more? They're just putting other paycheck, they're putting more money into the bank, okay? And now the interest rate falls because now the bank has more genuine savings from 10 to 5%, and then the factory borrows more because now it's cheaper to borrow money, okay? And then it's not just about dollars, physical resources are rearranged. So the point is continuing with that example, when there's genuine saving, the family's not eating out as much, that allows the, the factory to borrow more money and what's happening Again, this is a very simplistic thing, but I just wanted you to get the basic story. So in the year one, the restaurant, there's fewer, hires fewer workers and uses less raw materials. I think that's a picture of iron ore, in case you don't know. And then, so that ends up going into the factory. Okay, so my point is, it's not just about money. There's real physical changes happening to the economy because of these decisions that now uh, the, you know, the restaurant has to lay off workers or if they were gonna open a new chain, maybe now they won't because families aren't buying as many meals there 
but that's, you can't just look at that. You can't just say, oh my gosh, there's a collapse in, in restaurant spending. What are we going to do? No, you have to realize, well, that frees up real resources to go somewhere else. Now the factory can afford to hire more workers because wages are lower and they can get more natural resources because now the restaurant owners aren't bidding on as much resources because their own product, you know, their own services have dropped in, in demand. Okay, and so then the factory now is producing more hammers and other kinds of equipment. And so eventually, that's a year three, you can't, if you can't see it, now the restaurant's making more food than it was before. Okay, so it's a simplistic little story, but I'm trying to show you this is saving supported economic growth in the, in the Austrian vision where part of why we're so wealthier now than we were in the year 1800, yes, there have been technological developments, right? Scientists have come up with new formulas, have made discoveries. We know how to take a, a certain amount of stuff and turn it into better products now than we did in the year 1800. But another huge factor in why is it that we have a higher standard of living is because our workers have more tools and equipment than they did back in the year 1800. Uh, another way of seeing that distinction between technical know-how versus the equipment you're working with, suppose there was a cruise ship that got stranded on a tropical island somewhere and it was full of professionals, like people who were brain surgeons, top-notch lawyers, you know, doctors and so forth, engineers, and they're all on the tropical island, their standard of living would drop pretty fast, even though they were the best in their fields because they wouldn't have the right stuff to work with, right? The engineers could look around and see coconut trees and stuff and say, oh, if I had the right tools or somebody's having chest pains and it's the world's best heart surgeons right there, but if all he's got to work with are sticks and rocks, he's not gonna be able to do too much. Even though he's got all the, the best knowledge and training, he doesn't have the right tools. Okay, so by the same token, the people in 1800, part of why they were so poor compared to us, it's not merely that they didn't have the right technical know-how or they didn't know as much as we did, it's also they didn't have the right tools to work with. If, if a bunch of our experts went back in time, they would not instantly bring them up to our standard of living. It would take decades for them to save, you know, to get more tools than to use those tools to build better tools, to use those tools to build better tools and so on. Okay, so that's how things happen normally. And again, that gets messed up. If in, so part of the process is interest rates coordinate that. And so if interest rates are artificially low, these businesses are trying to produce that stuff but there's not enough genuine savings to go around. So after a few years, things come to a standstill. Okay, the single best, the best analogy I have ever heard as far as motivating the Austrian theory of what happens when in the boom bust cycle is one that Mises himself came up with. And he said, imagine that there's a master builder. So the, the context here is some people heard Mises' theory and said, oh, you're saying that the, the uh, business cycle is due to overinvestment, and Mises clarified, he said, no, no, it's not overinvestment, it's malinvestment, and then that's where he, he comes up with this analogy. So he said, imagine that there's a, a master builder, like someone who's working on a big building project, and he thinks he has so many uh, you know, units of, of wood, and so many bricks, and so many shingles, and so on, and he's got these kinds of workers of varying levels of, of expertise, you know, certain carpenters and just manual laborers and things like that. So he's got all these raw materials to work with, he thinks, on the, the job site. And now his job is to come up and draw blueprints up to say, this is the kind of house we're going to build. And then Mises says, suppose though he's ill-informed. What if actually, instead of having 10,000 bricks, he really only has 9,000? And so he draws up the blueprints of this house, thinking he's got 10,000 bricks to work with, but really he's only got 9,000 well, what, what's, what's going to happen? So clearly, he, you know, he st you know, starts laying the foundation, start building it. Duh, duh, duh. What, at what point does the builder want to know that information? Right, as soon as possible, okay? And so here I'm bringing it more into modern language here, so I'm, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on Mises' basic point. But think of it this way. Imagine that's happening... And, you know, some workers on the site realize, oh, wait a minute, there's a mismatch here. And they're, they're looking uh, at the amount of bricks in the project as it's being completed. And they realize, you know, it's going to be a shame if the master builder realizes we're a thousand bricks short. What's he going to do? What would be the very first thing you would do if you discovered that? If all your people are looking at the blueprints and they're working on the project, 
and then you're the guy in charge and you realize there's a thousand brick discrepancy between what the plans call for and what you guys are doing. Yeah, you would you would get the bullhorn out and say stop, right? And so loosely speaking, that's what a recession is. Stop and so you can imagine people, you know, the guys on those sites, that would be such a buzzkill. Can you imagine how, you know, those, look how happy those carpenters are. They're just banging out, working on that gazebo and stuff. This is, it would be a shame. We'd have all those unemployed idle resources if the master builder realizes it. And so let's, let's keep things going. Let's keep like throwing tarps over the, the amount of bricks because we don't want him to realize that there's a discrepancy. We want to keep the building boom going. Okay, and so that's kind of the analogy for what happens when there's artificial... Uh, government stimulus or the central bank seeing that the economy is slowing cuts interest rates and pumps in more money that it can keep the boom going but that's not what you want to do All right and so in, t in terms of the, the um, over investment versus mal investment Mises point here is to say the problem if you're trying to if this is what was going on it would be wrong to say the builder over invested in housing rather the issue is he didn't invest properly. He was trying to build a house that was too grandiose given the, re the resources he had to work with. It would have been better had he started construction on a more modest house. Okay, so again, the analogy is uh, when the if, if the business cycle is occurring because the central bank has artificially lowered interest rates, that gives a false appearance of more resources being available for investment. And so individual business owners start long-term projects borrowing at that cheap credit that there's not enough real resources to go around. They physically cannot all be completed. Like uh, consumers are not refraining from spending enough to free up the real resources to finish all these long-term projects. And so it's like you're building a house and you're gonna run out of bricks. And so again, if you were doing that, when do you wanna find that out? You wanna find that out as soon as possible. And yes, it will be painful, but the sooner that error is discovered, then what does the builder do? He takes the blueprints and says, okay, let me change things and rework it, given what we've already done. And then, you know, what we have left to work with, we'll make it, you know, so the finished house is not going to be as impressive or as nice as the original one of the blueprints, but that original one of the blueprints was physically impossible to build. And certainly the earlier you catch the mistake, the better the finished product will be, right? If you find out when you've only got two bricks left and you thought you had a thousand and two, if that's when you find out you could be in serious trouble. It might be, you know, you might not even be able to, to finish and put a roof on the thing, right? Whereas if you found out pretty early on, you could adapt things and the house wouldn't be that much different from if you had from scratch drawn the movements up correctly. Right? So that's, that's the idea. So Mises is saying, well, just the last slide here, the problem with fiscal stimulus or with um, central bank interest rates, cuts, and their monetary stimulus. The problem is that it is, um, if you understand the Austrian vision and how the market process works and the role that interest rates serve and how genuine savings for the economic growth occurs when things go right, as I have said, and then you understand what, how that can get interrupted, there can be an unsustainable boom that then collapses. It's ironic, perhaps, but the, the recession is actually like the good thing in the Austrian view. It's painful, but it's restoring reality, right? It's when these unsustainable projects stop and then resources get reallocated. There's a period of adjustment, just like, you know, on the work site, in the analogy of the master builder, if the, the builder realizes, oh my gosh, I mean, we don't have to make bricks as I thought, gets the blow around, everybody stop, hang on, I gotta revise the blueprints, and then only slowly maybe start putting people back to work. Okay, you carpenter, you can go to this, and so here I have a picture of a gazebo to show you know, maybe what would happen in this in a particular case is the people who were working on the gazebo, the you know, master builder might say, guys, you've got to stop. You know, in the revised plans now, it doesn't make sense for us to have a gazebo. We need those, you know, the lumber and the bricks or whatever that you were planning on using, the original blueprints called for. Uh, you know, after further review, no, I need that to make sure we get a roof on the main house. Or it's, so you got to stop. And yeah, it was done. We have this half finished as evil, but those resources are more urgently needed over here. So stop working on that. You can imagine, in light of the means of the whole project, that might be the decision. Of course, had they known from the get go how many bricks he had, he wouldn't have built half of the evil and then stopped. It would be 
used to. But the point is, right now, given that he found out that the table was half built, you can imagine the right thing being leave that thing half finished. We need those you know, resources to we need to finish that. We need it more urgently over here. It's more important to finish the main console garage. So, in that analogy, what would a deficit shuttle ready spending projects look like? It would be like some you know, politician strolls up, sees the work site hours after the master builder has discovered this discrepancy, tells everyone to stop. In particular, tells the guys at the gazebo, you know, we're abandoning that project that we can't do that anymore. And then you know, the politician's looking around, he sees the half finished gazebo, and like, well, that's, that's not helping anybody. He sees the workers sitting there, and there's piles of lumber and bricks just sitting there because the master builder is still revising the plan. And the politician, you know, says to the guys, you know, sitting around, well, you're unemployed. This is great. There's idle resources. There's idle lumber. There's idle bricks. Finish that gazebo. And then they finish it. And he, you know, puts his name on it. And it's the, you know, the Harry Truman gazebo or something. And then everyone drives by that. Thank goodness there was a government there to stimulate and create this gazebo because the market failed. It was just stuck in all these unemployed resources. So you can see in the analogy how that would be wrong. But people didn't see the whole picture and didn't understand why was there this unemployment and this halt in production. It would look silly. It would look like this, the system was broken or something wrong with the work site. It wasn't working the way it normally does. And thank goodness this politician drove by and put people back to work with the shovel ready project. But clearly, that would be making us poorer than we otherwise would be. Yes, we had this nice gazebo, but then people later would be complaining about, yeah, every time it rains in the main house, Water comes in because we don't have a good roof, and ultimately, yet yeah, because the stuff that we needed to make the roof better got siphoned off and put into the gazebo and it shouldn't have been. Okay, so a sort of silly analogy, perhaps, but I'm trying to see that is if you understand the Austrian view of the normal economy, how normal sustainable economic growth occurs, why that can go wrong, and then how there's a period of readjustment, and that's where the recession is. So, in that view, and this is the last comment I'll make to turn over your guys' questions. The, the problem is where the unhealthy decisions occur, the thing that messes up the economy, is during the boom period. Yeah, ironically, that's what most people think of as being prosperity, right? Because everyone's getting pay raises and, and businesses are hiring and expanding their output. But those are, are bad decisions. They're unsustainable. That's the recession. Yes, it's painful, but that's when reality is res resumed and there's a transition period where unsustainable projects need to stop. They need to lay those workers off because those workers are more important, you know, they're more urgently needed elsewhere. And so in a system where there's not some central bureaucrat telling you where to go, where it's the voluntary decentralized market forces guiding you, if workers are going to a factory that really ought to be shut down and lay the whole system and the needs of where resources need to be, how does that happen? Well, it's painful, but you get laid off. You know, that's one way to quickly, you know, that's the market's quick way of saying stop going to that factory because you, you, know, you can't keep sending more resources there. That's like the gazebo that, yeah, we should never have started it, but given that it's like that, we need to stop. You know, the resources necessary to continue that need goes elsewhere. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's the way of seeing the Austrian vision and what happens. So if there is a recession in the Austrian view, the right thing to do is not interfere with the market's mechanism. And certainly you don't want artificially lower interest rates to cause an upswing in investment because that's what just sets up another unsustainable boom. It might temporarily appear to generate prosperity just like the politician you know, put people to work and get them to work on a gazebo. And you're just looking at that and didn't see the big picture, you might think that's better than guys sitting around doing nothing because now we have a finished gazebo. But that's making us poor in the long 